sorry, did I have a whoop? Who whooped? Go on, who whooped? Why did you whoop? Are you okay? <laughs> yeah. you can call somebody if you need me help. So where's it? I can't cross. I can. How much further can I go for it? It's like an invisible line. Yeah. What happens? <laughs> yeah. That's all right. What about it? It's absolute lies. <laughs> okay, well, don't worry, I won't get that close to you. Um, front rows are always strange people. But what's been a front row of anything? It's weird, you just get picked on. Why, why do you want to be on the front row? Is it leg room? That's what speakers are for. <laughs> Aren't they? Okay. All right, cool. So we're going to talk about, um, I don't know, where can I go along? I've got some slides, I'll probably skip through them. Uh, it's a very interesting talk, which covered pretty much 90% of what I was going to cover today, so, which is fine. So you're going to get um, basically just reinforcements of some stuff, and completely different opinions on others, and uh, loads of other stuff. And this is the most important thing I'm going to talk about later on. There's no single person is going to tell you the right way to do things. Uh, you take everything on board, everybody tells you, and if you want to do it your own way, that's absolutely cool. If you follow what one person does, um, what's the point of that? You're not an individual, you're just a sheep, and you're following that person. So it's really important. Um, even when I was being taught stuff, um, I, I saw the career path of like, my mentor, I didn't want to go that path, I wanted to be veer off. Not that I didn't like what he was doing, I just thought I wanted to do something for myself. Anyway, so uh, a little bit about um, what my highlights of these things. I do have a formal Q&A at the end. I don't think, is it actually on a microphone or is it just like shout out? Is it like shout out if people want to ask a question? Yeah, so, so I don't really like doing that sort of like 15 minutes type of question and answers at the end because I don't know, you forget the question by that point because you're like, you want to die because you've been sat here for 45 minutes. Uh, I prefer to have interact with a bit. So if there's a question you want to talk about during this thing, I'll just run for an hour instead of run 45 minutes and do Q&A if that's okay with you. And if you don't ask any questions at all during that 45 minutes, it means we can all leave 15 minutes early, which works for me too. So it's totally up to you. But I would prefer it if you talk to me. It makes it better for me. Um, and it's a chance to ask me really in-depth, amazing questions that you've always wanted to ask. Um, that was sarcasm. I'm English. The thing is, come on, look. I were, I, last time I talked was in front of an audience in bloody Transylvania. It was like tumbleweeds and crickets. Everything I said, they didn't get the British humour. Is anybody here English? Anybody? Nobody here is English? Ah, oh, that's why. Are you all from, you're Romanian, aren't you? That's probably what it is. All right, that's fine. I can't even get my home country to laugh at my dry, sarcastic <laughs> jokes. I'm going to just go. Right, why, who am I? This is really high, isn't it? Who am I and why should you care? Why does the next one serve up? Oh, what can I give you? Well, the reason why, what, I mean, a little bit about what we talked about before is um, why I'm here. I'm here to share with you lots of things. What can I give you? Well, you don't really want to come anywhere too close to me, uh, especially bodily contact. Um, it's not good. Um, doctor did tell me fluid is the worst, but even just hand to hand, it's very contagious. So you don't want to come anywhere near me. Okay, I can give you all sorts of things. It's good. When you travel the world for 17 years, you pick up everything. It's great. So. <laughs> do you have any commu communicable diseases? Which ones? It's easy to say which ones do I not have. <laughs> That's a joke too. <laughs> or is it? I don't know. What can I give you? All right. Now, you are spending valuable time here, and some of you actually, who paid to be here? Anybody? <laughs> Nobody? One person. Everybody else is a freeloader. <laughs> Fantastic. You are going to have success, my friend. <laughs> yes, you've invested in an hour worth of incredible stuff. But you probably should have gone to see Star Trek right around the corner, because it's better. Um, but you won't get seven quid, you won't get into that, will you? You won't even buy your popcorn. So it's not bad value for money. Um, so, on a serious note, I have to give you experience, advice, Feel free to ignore me, as I said just before. Um, everybody um, give you advice. Don't listen to everything that you, you hear. Um, my experience, um, I've been doing this almost 25 years. Not as much as, how long have you been doing this? James? Well, I'm only 24, so... Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, I'm the, I'm the old sage of the of tonight then, right? Great, thanks a lot. Um, okay. And my experiences will help you, much like your tutors, your family, your friends. Everyone can give you advice. Everybody isn't an expert on everything. We'll tell you what your path to do. Has anybody here been told by their families, what do you want to go there for? What do you get a proper job? Proper course. Proper vocation. Anybody? Yeah, what do they say? What do they want you to do? Sorry? What do they want you to do, your family? When you said you want to go, go to Ravensport, they went, what? Um, I think my grandma was from the, the word 
Tesco's is good because you get 10% off. Um, I know that because I worked in Tesco's when I was at school. Before I, 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 they offered me a management training job, or I took a job at Sky, and that was my choice. 10% off for the rest of my life. Tesco's is pretty good, and they're getting better. They just introduced the, uh, their new you know, high-end food collection. I was like, it's going to be tough. I've made a mistake. I didn't take it. Um, but yeah, you know, is there any way you can combine them both? Maybe a part-time job still there. Even if you work you know, 16 hours a week, you can still get 10% off. I just think your nan will be happy. <laughs> I thought you were going to say doctor or lawyer. But she wanted me to work in Tesco's. Wow, really high ambitions from nan. I like that. Could at least aim for Waitrose and be a partner with them. You know? <laughs> much better. Much better. Do, you have, do you have Waitrose where you live? Hey. It's much better. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, that's it, we're out of time, right. I start off with a video, um, and we can kill night's video, can we? Are we able to do that? We'll just leave it up. Who's the gaffer here? No? no. Anybody got some stones we can throw? No? Oh, we'll have the lights on, it's fine. Oh, no. Not yet. Hang on. Hang on. Too late. Alright, I'm going to be doing this a lot. I'm showing 85 videos. Not really. Cool, great. This is a promotional campaign I did for Sony uh, that finished last year. The uh, great thing about promotional campaigns for Sony is it's paid work. Paid work is good, you know, which is what it's all about. We're all here to earn money, right? Yeah? Who's here to be an artist? And money is a distraction. <laughs> Who thinks money's a distraction? Go on, let's see it. Be honest. Pretentious bastard over there. <laughs> Why are you wearing a beret? Yeah, is it Bale Francais or Bale Francais maintenant? See, he's lying. <laughs> I can tell it. Okay. I had a guy on my on my Facebook page comment on about 85 posts going back three years or so, saying I'm not an artist because I take money to to, to shoot. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do I call myself an artist? Only in very pretentious moments. Oh, I'm trying to impress some hot girl. Sorry, sorry. Um, but, you know, it's all about earning money. At the end of the day, it's about earning money doing something which is a hobby, essentially. This is my hobby. Making films is my hobby. Shooting is my hobby. If I've got paid to take photos, it's my hobby. So, these lights are going up. I didn't say put them up. I was wondering if you'd do that so I could say that, so I was about to play the video. I'm very annoying. Um, so this is good, paid work is good, we'll talk about paid work versus unpaid work. But paid work is probably the best thing because it gives you money, if you need money you can pay your bills, you can buy presents, you can do whatever, and of course you can buy lots and lots of gear which will make you much better. We'll talk about that later. Louder please. Since I was a small kid, I wanted to be tough. Yeah. In my country, we didn't have like money to go boxing club, but we was to fight with kids with each other, you know? Yeah. Yeah. If you're good, you don't get punched. But you learn it. It's boxing. Everyone gets punched. When someone hits me, I get more, more upset. I want them to hit me more. You know, I get more tough. I get more crazy. I can take it, you know. I have 10 proper fights in the ring. I want every single of them. Two knockouts and maybe three or four stops in the first round. You don't go clapping, drinking, smoking, not for me. It's better doing boxing than doing those things. Um, I had 
six weeks to make this piece. Um, six weeks actually from the shoot to delivery, which is a ridiculously long period of time. Normally, if you give me six weeks, do you know when I will finish the edit? Anybody take a guess? Say, I mean, two, three, if I'm given six weeks, when am I going to finish the edit? Maybe more six weeks later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's generally what you do. Something gives you a stupid deadline, you stick to it. Now, somebody says to me, hires me, and says, like this, and I say, when do you want it for? They said, ah, just, you know, whenever it's ready. I'm like, do not say that. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a time frame, otherwise you won't get it done. Yeah, just when... <laughs> Seriously, it's like that. If somebody says, just when it's done, I, I'm not going to say I have a project sitting around that I started a year ago, but I might do, because that person said, just when it's done. So now I have to go and reshoot loads of it because so much of it's changed. You have to give me a deadline. You tell me tomorrow, and I'm like, okay, I will do it tomorrow. I wouldn't want to, but it's, it's... Anyway, they gave me six weeks. But I was disciplined. Do you know when I cut this piece? When? When did I cut it in that six-week deadline? When, when would I normally... When, what often happens, but this is the question, is when did I actually cut this piece within, within my six-week deadline? Take a guess. The seventh week. No, the seventh, the seventh of which day? No, seventh no, month? Months, seventh, months, seventh, months, seventh, no, 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 I did it on that night. Okay. Cut it that night. Um, because it was easy, it was in my head. It's easier to cut stuff when it's in your head. It's a very short piece, it was very tightly storyboarded to a degree. It wasn't storyboarded, it was shot listed, but it was all very much thought through. So it was a piece of cake and the rushes were 17 minutes long. So hardly anything to work through. Um, so I cut it that night. Did I deliver it to the client the next day? Actually, no, I spent the next day trying to just get the music sorted and doing the sound mix. So did I deliver it to the client the next day? or the day after. Super impressed them. Yeah, it's good to impress them, right? It is, absolutely, but I didn't. When did I, when did I, set hand, when did I give it to the client? It was the last week, it was, I think it was the Friday before the, the deadline was the following Friday. It was Friday, they said to me, how are you getting on? You know, they, they'd asked me a few things. I'm like, get in there, get in there, sending them a few frame grabs and stuff. And like Friday said, yeah, I'm pretty certain by Monday I should be okay. And the Monday they're asking me, how's it going? I'm like, I'm having trouble nailing this grey. I'm, I'm really close to it, really close to it. And made excuses. I eventually delivered it to them on Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock. I was, you know, being a perfectionist. Friday 3 o'clock means what? You give it something to a client at 3 o'clock on Friday on the last day of the deadline. What are they going to do? They're going to ask for 100 changes? They're going to go, OK, great, thank you. It's not the best way to do it, but it depends on, you know, this was the third in the series, and the previous two was hell, because it was literally, I delivered it really fast, really like the second day or third day. I then had five weeks of revisions, which you do not want to do. So it's finding the right balance between the two. Now, if you want to get something through to a client, I mean, black and white was too hard. The, gray, the color grades are beautiful, actually, but I, I thought it was going to be too, too much for them, so I gave them something which was even worse. Um, give them something even worse, and generally the client will say, don't like that, it's too much, bring it back, and you protest as an artist, you go, it's not my vision, and then you dial it back to exactly how you wanted it in the first place, and you go, okay, well, fine, and then you have what you want. It's like if you want to deliver a cut, you think it's too long, what do you do? You give them an even longer version, and then they, then they slash off some stuff. You want a horror film that's too gory, uh, you want to put a lot of gore in it, what do you do to get it? Past. You put even more in, so they cut back the stuff that you knew they would never pass. So it's all about never giving them what you want them to give them, always giving them too much, because they always want to take something away, they always want to have their say. It's really important. Just a, just a tiny bit of advice though when it comes to dealing with clients. A little bit back to me, it's all about me today. Uh, I spent a long period to start at Sky News, six and a half of my new production company, specialising in docs, corpus, music videos, fiction, personal film, you know, the unpaid ones, which means I'm an artist. I've also got a very busy website and do a lot of education work. I spend about a third of my time um, doing workshops and stuff. But when I'm doing them, I mix it in with shooting gigs. So that's enough about me. Um, oh, that's me when I was a bit younger. Uh, should you go to film TV school? Did I? Uh, which is the best path? Do you think you should go to a school? Am I? Is this a school? I can't put it properly. Is this a school or? Oh, is it like a film university? <laughs> that's the wrong slide to put up. Can you delete that slide? <laughs> Should you go to film TV school? Hands up. If you're here, then I'm assuming you're either like regretting your entire decision or you're very shy. You made a decision to come here, I'm assuming. 
right? You weren't like, you know, they wouldn't drag you off the streets. You wouldn't kidnap. <laughs> you know, all shackled there. All right. Should you go, to, which is the best path? It's a difficult one. I mean, there's no simple answer. I get asked this a lot. Did I go to film school? I didn't go to film school. I didn't go to film school. I tried to get into Ravensbourne in the late 80s. I didn't get in. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> I don't hold grudges. <laughs> Much. So it's good 24 and a half years later to be finally in Ravensbourne, although I don't think this campus was here back then. I think it was just the one in Bromley. Where is it? Kent somewhere. I can't. Back in the Not back in the Ravensbourne. Where is it? In Ravensbourne. That's, that's in Kent. Yeah, that's why it's called Ravensbourne. We're discussing why it's called Ravensbourne. Because it's in Ravensbourne. <laughs> Deep. Deep. Okay. Uh, anyway, I didn't get into film school, um, but I was just offered a job. And you know what? I wanted to earn money. So I was off the job more at the same time I was battling to get into film school. Because you know what? Back then, different to now, if I wanted to get my hands on a proper camera, proper gear, you're not going to go onto Amazon and buy yourself a quick kit for a couple of thousand. It's not as easy as that. It was you know, impossible. You needed people to have the stuff. So I got a job at Sky. Education is key. Whichever path you take, you guys, I'm assuming most of you here, but none of you have put your hands up, have come to Ravensbourne. Uh, the ones who haven't, which is everybody, um, I'm getting confused because nobody put their hands up, so I'm assuming nobody here is from Ravensbourne. You need, you need education. If you're 16 years old and selling yourself as a DP, it's going to be very hard. First of all, you have no credits, most likely. Secondly, you need education. Education is important. Best education for me was working at Sky because I was able to fuck up. Staff jobs are the best. If you can get into a staff job, it's the best thing you could possibly do to start your career because it gives you a chance to fuck up. The last thing you want to do as a freelancer when you're out there is fuck up. What happens when you fuck up when you're a freelancer? Go on. Exactly. What happens when you take your next client and you fuck up? What happens next? You try and find another client. I keep trying another client. It's okay in London. There's a lot of clients uh, to a degree. Eventually, you'll just run out of clients. And that's it. That's it. London's done. London's burned. I'm moving to Berlin, another country. And you fuck up. The key thing about fucking up is what? What happens when you make a mistake? What's the key thing you're supposed to do from that? And? Don't do it again. Don't do it again. There you go. So I made lots of mistakes while I was in a staff job, which was great for me because I was shit when I started and I got better because I was able to have that. And also, they were training me up. They were training me up, so they expected me to make mistakes. If I, in my first time picking up a camera and shooting something, could have produced a masterpiece, they'd be like, that's strange. Where are you from? <clears throat> so I, I started doing stuff like that, and then and then lots of long-form docs and stuff. Couldn't go back to news, hence I left. Um, but also I left for other reasons. Uh, needing new challenges, something that's going to be really important to you is constantly, constantly, that helps actually a lot. Uh, constantly be pushing yourself. And also my outlook on the world was changing. I didn't really, really notice, sort of started talking about this recently, and I was like, you know what? I, it's part of the reason why I left. I was becoming a bitter, miserable bastard. Um, because I was traveling the world, seeing how shit everybody was to each other. And, you know, if you do that for a long period of time, it really gets to you. And I was seeing people around me, and I, I didn't realize how, you know, why these people were miserable and grumpy and cynical about everything in life because they've been doing it longer than me and this is where I was going I don't want to become that person and honestly once it's very you know what do you watch when you watch news generally not the nice stuff it's the crap the crap and it's you know it's more and more and more it feels like the news and it's just it took a huge um, toll on me and I and that's why I went into the documentary documentary Phoenix was able to just concentrate on other stuff and then which w was so much better doing the stories about people and other things. I still did some news stories, but they're always much longer form. Um, but uh, the, the Yashi unit closed, so I left. So it was all right. And life, life isn't long, and I made the most of it. And having spent 17 years in one company, it was a terrifyingly long period of time, considering I was 18 when I joined. I was like, wow, I can't have spent half my life here. Time to quit. So I did. Uh, I had to leave. I had no life anymore. Who, who asked me about my time management? So that's been my time manager. I can't remember these weeks. Oh, yeah, there he is. He's in there. I, I don't manage it. I don't. I'm always doing something. Uh, it's it's a nightmare. You give it up because when you go freelance, it's, it is much harder than being staff. I had a five day on, five day off job at Sky. I had six weeks holiday. 
I had a salary of like £75,000 plus overtime. Um, I had a great pension. I had a car. It's a fucking great life. And most importantly, at the end of the day, I got to just like, thank you very much, I enjoyed today. Now I'm going to watch TV and not think about it because you've got something else tomorrow. But, you know, is clocking in, clocking off. It was a very comfortable life. Uh, so since then, I've, I've done all sorts of different things and had fun. Um, I've tried to mix up my genres. This is a documentary called How to Have Start Revolution. Um, I'll talk a little, tiny bit about festivals. I know it's talked about a little bit there. I'm not a huge fan of them for various reasons, but this one did super well uh, for us. It uh, won Rain Dance, Best Documentary, and loads of other um, things. We even picked up a BAFTA for it, so it did very well, and it sold. It does sell. Some stuff does sell. And when you do make things, you've got to figure out a way of actually what is a good length. Because the irony is, this is a 90-minute feature. The version that sold was our broadcast TV edit, which was 46 minutes, which is half the film. So it was a bit shit. Um, but that's what sold. Companies don't want features, generally. To broadcasters, that is. Broadcasters don't like features because it's an awkward thing. It's an awkward time. Generally, features are also... They're messy lengths, and it's trying to fit in commercial breaks into that. It's very, very difficult. But it did really well, and I worked on Red Tails with Mr. Lucas, uh, which was a lot of fun, even though I didn't really get to do much, because um, it was one of these shoots which was so, 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 so controlled that you had to point the camera in a specific way. The light had to be a specific angle for every shot. It was all completely mapped out. I just left a little room for creativity. And if, if anybody ends up working on very large crews, you'll find this. It's, it's good and it's bad. I like working in a team. But not if the team is 300 people, because then it's, you are just part of a big factory. So. But it was a good experience, and good to do. Um, oh, this is going to be harsh, isn't it? So what can you expect to go and do when you leave Ravensbourne? Come on, give me some answers. What do you want to do when you leave? I'm going to get you to say something. Whoever says the next thing will win. Let's go. <laughs> it's good. It's solid work. You get a discount. Sainsbury's give you 12%. Anybody want, anybody want to work in Lidl or no, Asda? No. What do you want to do when you leave? Uh, primarily sort of extreme sports documentaries, like Great. Red Bull, GoPro, things like that. Sure. Yeah, there's, there's certainly stuff out there. Um, very specialist, but if that's what you want to do, that's great. You may not end up doing it all the time, but it's good. What, what about you? Maybe films. What sort of films? <laughs> Four names? Uh, no, uh, feature films. Short films. Feature films? Will you make money from it? Not at first. What about, you will make money at some point? Yeah. That's good, positive. Okay, what are you going to do when you're not making any money? Um, <laughs> Kickstarter. <laughs> Kickstarter. Help me eat this year <laughs> whilst I try and make my film. I have writer's block. I need food. My goal this year is $200,000. What do you get for reward? I don't know. What about Kickstarter? Um, it's really going to be hard. Uh, anybody here, apart from you, want to go out and shoot features? Make features? Okay. How many of you want to win an Oscar? <laughs> <laughs> I want to win at least two. Surely we want to win an Oscar. You want to win an Oscar, don't you? You've got to have, you have two because they're on, you know, like bookends. One's annoying, and it's put it in the middle, and then it's in the way you mirror. It's better than the end of a mantelpiece, right? If I get three, it's going to get really confusing. <laughs> Doorstop, yes, actually, I actually, um, I went, to, I'm not name dropping, remember, I went to Robert Rodriguez's house a few years ago, and he's got loads of awards, and they, he literally is using them as doorstops and things like that, you know, he's like, what's this one? Some, some horror magazine or something like that, blimey, it's cool, but not tell them it's there, but they're nice and heavy, the heavy ones are good for doorstops. Um, it's going to be hard, I've got to be honest with you, you're going to struggle, um, because whilst you're, how long is your course, Jeremy? Three years, four years? Three years. Whilst you're in here for three years, what are the people who decided not to go and do film school doing in this three years? Working. working. They're still going to be learning. They're going to be working, potentially taking, getting jobs and building up a name for themselves. It's, you know, it's, it's difficult. I think it's important to have that education, though. Is it harsh to say you're going to struggle? I think a lot of you here are, are going to struggle enormously. It's just a fact of, of life. It's the same as any of you. When you leave university, no matter what you, you study, you're going to struggle. It's just what happens when you come out of education. This is harsh. <laughs> out there it sucks. It's full of backstabbing people trying to take advantage of you. You end up doing not, doing not work that you want to do. For very little money, in fact, you will earn more working at a local coffee shop or at McDonald's making 
making you question your whole existence and the time you spend here. You'll be treated not as an artist, but as a service. Is that harsh? Is it harsh? I don't know. Is it harsh? I should have put it in Tesco's. Had I known, I'd have put it in Tesco's, which is true. It's like this in just about every, every competitive vocation out there, so I don't think it's special. And that was pretty much the first three years um, in broadcast. I got a job because I didn't go to, you know, to the film school until I wanted to earn money. So I spent, I earned money, every single penny went into the train fare. So, what was the point of it really? But I, of course I got a great experience. It's really hard, it would take time to actually get yourself out there. So don't expect to jump into gigs. Don't expect to jump into like your dream gig. Some people here will, some people get really lucky and that's a big factor in success. Eventually you'll get there, there's no such thing as an overnight success. Well there might be, um, there are a few. Most people's overnight successes take a fair long amount of time. Mine took 20 years. Uh, hopefully yours won't take as long. But uh, just as long as you go out with realistic expectations of you are going to have to work hard and you have to do the daily grind. So what do you need to make it? Do you think this is the most important thing? Isn't it? What is? Huh? You've got hunger. Well, if you haven't eaten for a year, you probably be very hungry <laughs> because you've got no money. Um, drive is important, absolutely. But what's the point of having this amazing drive and then somebody gives you money to make a film and you're shit? <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Alright, it's a very important. I mean, well, most of these are really equal, but I think talent is incredibly important. Um, the fact that you got in here means you have talent. They don't let you in if you don't have talent, hence, I didn't get in. <laughs> Patience is important, so don't expect overnight success. A bit of patience will really be very rewarding. This is really important, confidence in yourself. I know some incredibly talented filmmakers who earn nothing because they have no confidence. So if a client phones up and says, we want you to make this film for us, and we have this amount of money for budget, and we think you're the guy, and you'll go, am I? Oh, can you do this for us? And like, oh. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I, think I might be able to do it. I don't know. I don't know if I'm good enough. Um, you need to show confidence. Yes, I'm the person for you. I can absolutely deliver the exact thing that you need. Even if you can't, then you go, phone down shit. <laughs> now I'm going to have to learn how to do this, 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 and this, and this. But confidence is important. If you don't show confidence, whether that's getting a gig or whether that's actually on a set, you don't want to be a DP and, and not knowing what to tell your gaffer or your, your AC. You don't want to be um, a director who's sitting there, I'm sure, you need to show confidence in every single aspect of every single part of filmmaking. If you don't show confidence, then it seeps into everybody else, and you probably won't get work. Confidence is one of the most important things to do. Anybody here not have confidence? Well, you're better than me, because, yeah, you won't put your hands up. I didn't have confidence for quite a number of years. Um, so it's, it's something that you need to have, and you need to learn confidence. Ability to work in teams. Now, well in teams, that means a great personality who's able to just... Not be like a control freak. And so you're not always going to work in teams, you're not always going to work in a crew, sometimes you work on your own. But the ability to work well in teams is really important. And a lot of people who are like, try to take over everything, and that's a terrible thing to do. I still think talent is key. Without any of, without this thing, things have changed. You know what's changed in the industries from when I started to now? That makes talent the most important thing? Yeah. Availability of gear. Availability of gear. Everything's available now affordably, whereas when I was there, it wasn't. So people were getting work because they had gear. They had the money to buy the gear. They had access to the gear. Now we all have access to gear. You should be able to. Therefore, talent is the most important thing, coupled with confidence. And a bit of luck. Luck is important. And skip through this because I'm running a lot. Networking is important. Uh, you've got network here, which is fantastic. Social media, absolutely, get on Twitter, use Facebook, I think they're very good, use Twitter for making contacts. Uh, collaboration, you know, you don't know what to do, you've got loads of people here you can work with, you want to make a film this weekend, they are you, and you, and you, go out and make a film this weekend. You got a gig? I can lend you an Alexa. I'll give it to you, sort of. Um, <laughs> collaborate, who, here makes, who makes collaborative films outside of their curriculum? And everybody should put their hands up. It's important. It's great to be able to do stuff outside. You're not just, otherwise, you're being told to make the film. It's better to go out and make films without, you know, just come up with ideas. It's not part of my curriculum, but I don't care. I'm going to go and do this. It's about, that's about drive and hunger. 
because it makes you want to go and do it. Uh, showing your work off is important, uh, you know, whether it's festivals. I think the internet is a really good thing. I just touch on this very, very briefly about festivals and compared to the internet. If your film is of an unsaleable type, as in like a short, which generally shorts don't really sell, um, then I think entering into festivals is a bit of a waste of time. It may get noticed by a few people, but I think it's better to get, I'd rather have it be a star pick than Vimeo, than it gets shown in, in four or five festivals, and if it, get, if it gets picked, waste, you know, spend a lot of money, it gets seen by five, six hundred people. I'd rather get 60, 70,000 views in two days on a star pick for a short. Now, if we're talking about something which is saleable, then that's different. Then you want to market it like Counter-Star Revolution. But for certain things, the great thing about getting a viral video as such is it gets you noticed and gets you work. Uh, a friend of mine, James, who I'm setting up um, a company with at the moment, he is, is my main shooter, and he had a viral video. And he has been working back to back off the back of it, purely for the style that he created in that. So he would not have got that any other way. So, um, Teamwork, although it's a tiny team, to, I relied on teamwork, um, absolutely essential. I relied on James to operate. I'm not checking his shot constantly. I'm making sure he's doing his job. Um, there's less, less regards to other stuff like this with regards to sound because there wasn't a sound recorder as needed. Um, but with sound, it's a tough one because it requires you to rely upon the sound recorder to do their job. If you've got a gaffer, you know when a gaffer's not doing a good job because you can see it. But the whole point is for you to just let go and do it. Do it and just let them get do their job. Last thing you want to do is come into the edit and go, shit, that sound is terrible. Or he's out of focus. Teamwork is essential. I shot a, the launch video for the GH3 camera in, um, in LA last summer. And the camera barely worked. I mean, it barely worked. I like, had to turn it on and off every shot. We had no monitoring apart from just the back screen. Uh, it was just a nightmare. And my operator was about 85 years old. I kid you not. He'd worked on everything. And I was like... We had no monitor, I was DP, and I'm like, it looks great to my eye. I looked in the screen, I think it looks good. How's it looking to you, Terry? It's, yeah, it looks good, it looks good. All right, okay. Um, he, he's got no peaking, he's got no ability to help with his focus. He's 85 years old, and I trusted him. Um, it took me about, I don't know, a couple of hours before I learned to trust him. I worked with him before, I was told he was great. But he was great because he would say to me, he'd say to me, if I said to him, Terry, did you get the shot? And he went, I don't think so. Which meant basically but the yeah, didn't have the focus was very hard. We had focus puller, but he was looking in there. And the focus pullers go they're going off, going off, they're going off the traditional mark, traditional way of focus pulling, which is a problem because we're using shitty still lenses, which means you have a throw of like that, which meant it's a nightmare. So but then when he said to me, Yeah, I got it, I went, Great, we're moving on. There's no me taking the card out, putting it into the computer and going, No, you didn't. It's about trust. You've got to have trust. And that takes time. Building up a good team is essential. Um, we've already asked that question, what do you want to do? We only have a couple of people who want to actually make films um, here. The rest of you still want to go back to Tesco's. Make your man happy. Just go one day, just dress in the uniform, just to pretend that you're there. Yeah, we have a new uniform. It's fine. You can easily get them. Just when you get to Tesco, just go out there and you see what it says no entry. Go through there and you'll find a uniform. It's fine. Or just go and sign up. Just sign up for a laugh. Just sign up, get your uniform and never turn up again. There we go. You won't get your discount card for, for three months, just to let you know that. Uh, Talked about this. Uh, this is really important. See, when you're not making your Oscar winning films, you are going to actually have to earn a living in filmmaking. Filmmaking means everything. Who here wants to shoot weddings? No one wants to shoot weddings. Huh? Who wants to get married? The old fashioned lot. The rest of you modern. Weddings is a, is a really growing market in the UK. In the US, I mean, photography is much higher in the UK for doing weddings, but in the US, I know people are shooting weddings and, and bringing in 20, 30K per wedding. That's pretty good. And what does that give you, 20, 30K? Money for stuff that you want to do that you won't be able to get money for. So it's a way of making money. And you know what? If you can make a wedding look great, then you're a great filmmaker. If you can make a wedding uh, that's, and show it to somebody who knows nothing about anybody in it and make them sit through it and enjoy it, you know what you are? You're a great filmmaker. And that's the key thing. If you can make a documentary about something which s somebody you know has no interest in at all and make them watch it and enjoy it, again, you're a great filmmaker. And that's the key thing. You should be making films which appeal 
to everybody to a degree. It's not going to happen, but that's the key thing. No matter what you're making, my, my aim with everything I make is that it will be watched, it can be watched by anybody. Which basically my problem is, it's always my mum. So will my mum enjoy this? I hope so. Um, but she'll, she'll always say yes, even if she hated it. Because I never actually watch her watching it. So did you watch it? And she went, yeah, it was great. And she's probably going, God oh, damn, what a pretentious piece of crap. Um, I think it's really important if you can try and aim for that, if you can. So and it's also really important is to um, always aim high, but you won't always get the jobs that you want. But it doesn't mean you should then, because you're doing a lesser job, I'm doing a corporate video for a, a, like a car dealership down the road. Does it mean you do a shitty job? Does it? They're paying you £2,000 to shoot for half a day and deliver them a two minute piece for the web. Should you give them a crap piece? Nobody really knows what to say to that. It's a no, it's a no brainer. Of course you do. Give them a great job. Why do you give them, why do you give them a great piece? Come back, build up a reputation, build up a reel, even if you use the tiniest bit. It's great to just keep on working, and of course it's money, and money's important. Um, and the key thing is, and this is the most important thing, what you don't want to do is do a shitty job on anything you shoot because you feel crap about yourself. And the last thing you want to do is go at home at the end of the day and go, God, I hate this job. I hate this job. Which was basically when my dad came home every night. And I thought work was going to be the most miserable experience of my life. I thought you earn money for a family to support them, and the rest of the time you hate your life. That's it. <laughs> and I assumed that's what you're supposed to do. And I was so pleasantly surprised that you could do a job that actually you enjoy. I was like, oh, this is actually good. I don't hate everything. But I got to a point, though, where I, was, you know, I wasn't making an effort. That's when you start falling out of love with what you're doing. And if you start doing work that you really hate all the time, you become bitter and twisted, and then you... That means your hobby is no longer your hobby, which is your work, and it becomes something else. So it's really important to put everything you can possibly can into every single thing. Now, for me, uh, the, the, what's going to show me talent is if I tell you, hello, I'm going to send you off to the Maldives to shoot beaches and hot chicks on the beach and palm trees. Okay, I expect you to come back with some really nice shots. You, you are going to do. 20 interviews in the same room, and they all look different. Which is the most challenging? Yours. If you pull it off, I'll be well impressed. You, bring, you deliver me the stuff, and it looks great, I'll be like, well, of course it's going to be great. Don't expect anything other. I've set you the most incredibly challenging task, and you, if you've delivered, I'm like, you are a go-to guy. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not saying it will be a competition, but I think it's, if you can do that, you can do anything. I think the fact, I did, when I say news, I had to do similar sort of things. On, in a corridor for news, where you had to shoot the same corridor every day for like eight or nine interviews a day, and I made every single one of them different every single day, and you wouldn't know. And that was a combination of lenses, distance, lighting, all sorts of things. Actually, one of the things that made it different each time was a particular person who was being interviewed, so it tended to look different. But you know what I mean. So it's really important to give 100% to everything. If the moment you, you start clocking and clocking off is the moment you're on a downward slope. This is, this is a, we, I've touched on this a few times. I don't know anyone who just does the work they want to do. You might find the tiniest percentage in Hollywood, like David Fincher, Spielberg. Those sort of characters will do the stuff they just want to do. That's about it. Very, very few. The rest, rest of us, we have our passion projects, which we fund ourselves, whether it's through Kickstarter, or more likely, and more, I think, better if you earn money doing other stuff to fund the stuff that you want to do. And if that film ends up making you money, and you get an Oscar, BAFTA, whatever, it's been fantastic. But it's, um, I just think that you just got to set your sights on making money and knowing that the stuff that you really want to do may not be, is, is pretty much unlikely to be happening every single day. This is getting a real downer, isn't it? Is it getting a downer? It is a bit. Is anything beneath you? Come on, I want to hear you, somebody say something. Who's not saying anything? What's beneath you? All right, so that's definitely true. Uh, but what about actual types of work? No. No? No. 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 Porn's beneath you? Yeah. Yeah, it is these days. It's not very good quality, is it? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I've never seen any. Um, <laughs> some stuff might be beneath you. Depends, you know. Some stuff you may think, oh, God, I'm not doing this. But very, if you know what? If you've not worked for six months, is anything beneath you? 
not that point, no. <laughs> You'll take anything. Yeah, yeah, I do, that's fine. I'll film your, your kid's birthday party, I don't give a crap. 50 pounds, yeah, I'll take it, fine. <laughs> You're desperate, you need money. So, you know, it comes down to, if I've shot a commercial for Adidas one week and then I get asked to do, do some B-roll of a call center the next week, I'm gonna go, this is beneath me. I did an Adidas commercial last week, God no. No, terrible attitude, I'll do it anyway. And you know what, I'm gonna give them the best looking B-roll shots of a call center they've ever seen in their life, because I give 100%. You got to. So, I don't think, you know, if you are able to pick and choose, then great. Um, I, I get loads of offers, um, and I get, do I get to pick and choose? Sometimes. A lot of times I take stuff because I need the work and I need to pay the bills. Ambition, is ambition important? Yeah. Of course it is, ambition is very important. Um, as long as you're realistic in your ambitions, don't expect if it, by the time you get to 24 that you're a failure if you've not won an Oscar or you've not had a feature film distributed. Um, it's, you know, it's a long old slog for some people, so it's be ambitious and always be ambitious, but don't, you know, don't, don't run, you know what I mean? Just take it easy, take your time, and it'll get there. Bread and butter. It's very, I didn't realize it was so depressing. I don't know. I just have this miserable part. I do need a happy pill. Have you got any of those? You guys must have that sort of stuff. You're students. Um, so anyway, it can be boring, but you have to pay the bill. So I just, it's just about the reality of filming. But the, the most important thing is if you are shooting stuff and you are making it look good and you're challenging yourself in making this really shitty thing like the 20 interviews good, is you're actually happy. You are happy because you've made something really good out of something. The rest of the time, you go and shoot something for yourself if, if you're really not doing it. And this is what I do, is certainly what I did for a long period of time, when I was working in the work that I wanted. I was shooting like single camera football matches for God knows what division. One single camera up on the gantry, just like, this is really going kind of wrong. And then it was even worse, it was rugby when I didn't even know how to, the game was played. I'm like, what am I supposed to do here? What are they doing now? Am I supposed to zoom in or zoom out? A bloody nightmare. I did that for you know, a number of jobs, and eventually I, you know, I got other offers, and I was able to like, okay, no more of that. Um, but whilst I was doing that, I was doing stuff for myself. And the great thing about it is no client, no boss, who's in charge, you are. And you can go wild and have fun, just like being, making a student film. Um, and it keeps you happy and fulfilled. I did, I, that's why if you go onto my Vimeo page, I have like 260 bloody videos on there. Um, and I would say probably about 40 of them are paid work, and the rest are just personal stuff I put up there, because I just kept, I was very prolific and enjoying it and getting a lot out of it.